So, okay. so I'm going to post it under week two uh, under modules, okay? And also, if we use extra uh, set of slides, I will add it there as well. So what I what I want what I want to say that you know, do you remember the link that I one of you guys created, and you know, you guys start adding your name under certain groups. Do you still guys already in the process of this, or you guys are done? Everybody already located his name. I think we're done. Yep. Cannot hear anything. Hello. 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 Yes. We can hear you, Professor. We yeah, can go hear ahead. you. And so what and... I'm saying, everybody, everybody, already added his name under group or not? Yeah, I think yes. we're done. So we're done, right? Okay. So by tonight or tomorrow morning, I will send you guys invitation to check your email that will come from GitHub. And from there, I will start sending everybody what to what topics per group, and you guys can take one week to select, and based on that, we're gonna start work. That makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Now we're gonna continue and resume our discussion about chapter one. So, if you guys remember, we were talking about the transistors and all these things. That's fine. And then we came into that. You know, there is two different type of architecture. One is called what Von Neumann or Neumann architecture versus that. Harvard architecture, right? What did we say about Newman architecture? Newman architecture, it had been created by the mathematician Van Neumann in 1950 something. And then this guy basically, he came in, into the conclusion that you know we need to build ISA, an instruction set architecture that will be running as a processor. And he said, the memory we have is gonna be a big, huge pile of uh, storage elements that will be storing data and instructions. Right? Do you guys remember that? Yes. Hello. Ah. Uh, and we can hear you, Professor. You remember that, right? Let me let me turn off this. I think. I think it has some issues. Anyway, so in in that case, you know, the that guy came and said that okay, we're gonna do this, but you know, we have to we have to fulfill a requirement, and this requirement is what. Um, uh, uh, the memory will be segmented into pages and each page will be constructed only data or uh, instructions. There is no way for you to have data and instruction in the same page, right? And then the, the most famous computers is basically using the uh, uh, Newman architecture is the x86, uh, which is basically the Intel processor based and AMD. Of course, there is other architecture like you know power architecture, which is uh, belong to IBM. It's completely different than the story. Then you know people start splitting that memory that consists of pages, instruction, or data into two memories. One is basically hosting the data, while the other one is hosting what an instruction. And we call this what Harvard architecture, right? Do you guys agree? Yes, Professor. Super. Now we are moving into different category of an, uh, architecture, which basically opened the door for us later on to understand what is risk architecture and why we are studying MIPS as an example of risk architecture. So there is two different type of ISA. So if you guys remember what ISA stand for, an instruction set architecture. An instruction set arc architecture and the two most important uh, architecture out of this is basically one is called risk and the other one is called CISC. risk risk stands for reduced instruction set computer while CISC is a complex instruction set computer architecture in the in, in the reduced instruction set computer or architecture we have to deal with pieces inside the computer, right? Everybody know that, you know, in your, in your laptop, right? There is memory, there is um, graphical uh, processing unit, uh, which is basically treating the VGA and monitors, and you already have the CPU, and you already have also, you know, the peripheral like a keyboard and mouse and so on, right? So how the instruction will be executed, of course, you will need to store and load data, 
from the memory. So the set of instruction in RISC dealing with memory is only loading and storing instruction from the memory. That's it. Loading and storing what instruction from the memory. There is no way to process data in the memory in the RISC architecture. Then the data format, the data it needs to be processed. It cannot be processed from the memory. It has to be moving to a level of registers. It's called GPR. So let me add you extend here and I will tell you more about it. So add page. So, you know, in, in risk, in risk architecture, here is our memory. Right? The only operation is permitted for, for this memory, either that allocating data inside the memory or getting data, retrieving data from the memory, right? So that's why loot and store. Second, there is no way for you to process the data coming from the memory immediately. It has to be moving to another level, which is a set of registers here, registers, register, 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 R1, R2, R3, whatever, whatever. And we call this GPR, which is what general purpose registers. I believe you have something kind of similar in the microcontroller, right? It's a set of uh, unique uh, uh, registers that will be used for processing data. So that opened the door for us to understand the arithmetic logic unit the add and rotate, add and rotate and XOR, whatever operations will be processing the data here. So the ALU will be communicating with what? With the GPR. So GPR, they call it in the computer science indirect stage. That means, you know, ALU cannot directly talk to the memory, but ALU will be talking to the memory through what? GPR. That makes sense? Or it's not clear? That makes sense. So then each instruction, this is something unique about REST. Each instruction roughly takes same amount of time, which is implicitly have a indirect meaning. So imagine from our knowledge of the 2300, add is the main operation for other operations. Do you guys agree? Like for instance, if I would like to subtract, literally I am actually adding. Right? So if you remember A minus B is basically A plus B complemented plus one, right? And if you would like to multiply A to B, it's not a straightforward multiplication. It's a set of adding and shifting that will help me to process that uh, multiplication, right? But you know, from the way that I said here, each instruction roughly takes same amount of time. Literally, it takes a cycle or two cycles maximum. That actually tell you the circuit will be doing a multiplication, will be relaying more on what? Combinational circuit. Do you guys agree? In that case, the critical pass, which is the longest pass between the input and output will be what? Stretched, right? So we can actually get a conclusion out of this line saying that, you know, as the instruction, all the instruction use the same number of cycles, so the maximum frequency will be what? Dropped significantly. You guys agree? If it's not clear, I can repeat. Is it clear? Professor, can you um, explain it one more time? Sorry. Sure, sure. So I, 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 the question for you, right, Nathaniel? Now, you know, if I multiply, right? Multiplication normally is what? Add and shift. There is a very well famous uh, method we're going to use for integer multiplication in chapter three. It's called add shift method. What is this? Normally, if I say 34 times 
22. What do you do? Can you tell me? Mm, calculate the four and two and... Uh, they're gonna be two, four yeah. times four, two times three. Then you shift. So they're gonna be what? Two times four, two times three. Then you will again, what adding? You agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are in a binary world, so basically that's one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, right? Here's zero, 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 one, 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 right? How are we gonna do it? There is no more, there is no more multiplication, right? It's basically, you know, if zero is zero, shift, right? So shift, mm, shift, yeah. shift, 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 until you will get you one, right? Then one, you're gonna put here one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one. And then, oh, there is another one, you know, that mean you will shift and add. So basically gonna be what? One, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one. Then, you know, there is another one that mean, you know, you will shift again and add. So basically gonna be here, oh, Shiza. It gonna be one, zero, whatever, whatever. Then you will start adding again, right? Yeah. This is a lot of process, right? If, mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you use sequential, that will be more costly than just adding. Do you agree? Yes. Because you have a flip flops and you will have time and clock and whatever, right? So that will not be like just one adding. But if you would like to implement this completely, entirely in one cycle, so that means you just need one sequential element like flip flops. And then, you know, after that, everything will be translated as what? Combinational circuit. Do you agree? Yes. In that case, if I look into the passes, between input and output, what will be the longest pass ever can happen? It would be more stretchy than if you just add, right? Yes. Normally, when we define the maximum frequency, if you guys remember from 2300, we we'll look to what the longest pass. So the circuit will consider stable if we take the slowest pass as the official path of time used between the input and output. It's not like racing. In racing, the fastest is the winner, right? But in the in the circuit, the the slowest is the winner, right? If you start adding the elements between the input and output, like a and an or and x or and flip flop in the middle, right? That will give you the total amount of time for the longest path. Do you agree? Mm, yes. If you flip that, that will be the maximum frequency, right? I think so. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to put too much, but you understand You understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, 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 I understand. Thank you very much, Professor. But you know, in general, what I would like to tell you, literally, literally like this, right? You have, uh, if you even, you know, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you something. The equation of the power is what? Power is half CV square, right? Mm -hmm. Capacitors, here, right? And then, you know, there is another equation of the power which is related to frequency, right? So if my frequency go down, my power will what? Will go down, yeah. right? So the relation between power and frequency like this, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, this gentleman instruction roughly taken some amount of time and taken so much time time, that means, you know, end of the day that, you know, the duration will be completely what? It changed and the maximum frequency would be affected, right? Yeah. In the top of this, there is something it's called sampling addressing modes. What is sampling addressing modes? You guys have taken in the, in the 3301, right? Microcontroller. You learn for the PF, uh, whatever, 18, right? The, the microchip uh, uh, microcontroller. There is addressing modes, right? What is addressing mode? Addressing mode, if you if you remember, either that you know I will have the address, I will have the offset, I will have the base, and this will be looking into a certain location in the memory that will be hosted in one of the registers. That's one addressing mode. There is another addressing mode, which is basically the offset. It needs to be recalculated in an indirect way that will be also indirect way added to the base. And based on that, you know, you will get the value coming from the memory. So there is a bunch of uh, attempts for you to calculate this equation. It can be one or two steps. So we consider this just what 
simple addressing mode. There is no more complication in addressing mode. Like, you know, there is nothing that will come into the point that I have to multiply or divide or, you know, uh, subtract with multiplication or integration, then I will be able to get the, uh, address, the final address that it will be pointing for data. So that's one of the unique thing about risk. So if anybody asks you so far about risk, you will tell him what? This is a very famous question, even for people who go for an interview, especially with Intel and IBM. They will tell you what is the difference between risk and risk. You can tell them literally, uh, memory accessibility is only load and store. Memory addressing modes are very simple. Data is processed through the registers. There is no way for you to process data coming from the memory directly. The, all the instructions are taken almost the same amount of time, which is indirectly affecting the, the maximum frequency and also the amount of power will be consumed by the chip. Uh, what type of the uh, what type of um, chips that are actually using the RISC? So RISC virtually all the instructions set in 1982 have been RISC, and you know one of them famous is called M680000, and that was announced in 1980. Okay, now let's go into the our competitor to the RISC, which is basically CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computer. In that one, there is a way for you to process data coming from the memory. So you don't need this indirect to communicate with the memory. So of course, there is a luxury for the CISC to talk to the GPR and also to talk to the memory and add and, and, add and multiply and subtract directly from the memory. So it's no longer just loading and storing, which is opening the door that you also CISC you can load and store. So you can naively load and store, or you can apply a process on the load and store before you start load and store, right? And the top of that, not every single instruction taking the same amount of time at the rest, which is makes sense. Multiplication might take more cycles than adding. Subtract might take also more cycles than sub adding. And division, same thing. So in that case, the clock period of every single instruction is different, which is opening the door to make this ship running in a high frequency than RISC, which is also implication, imp implication that, you know, the chip will be consuming more power than RISC. And definitely, if this one is simple addressing mode, this one is complex addressing mode, because end of the day, you are what? Processing while you are loading on a store. Does it make any sense to everybody? Makes sense. Super. Uh, professor, quick question. Yes, sir. When it comes to the, the CISC architecture, so you said it can access memory directly. It doesn't have to go through the uh, GPR. The, no, we're you can I mean, oh. there, is, there is a luxury for you to process in the GPR and also in the memory. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. It's not just Thank GPR. You. Let me tell you something. Fundamentally, every single processor has a GPR. Why? Because the response time of the GPR is way better than the response time of memory, right? Think about it. If I have four or five locations and I'm searching out of them, it will be much, much easier for me than you know searching in a million locations in the memory, right? So the response time, of course, of those four or five will be much faster than response time of finding something in a million location, right? Yeah. So of course, indeed, we will need this in a certain level of programmability while we are using the chip, right? OK. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Thank you. As we are engineer, when somebody gives you a problem, you can have infinity way to represent the answer or the solution, right? So one of the way to represent the answer is like this. There was another way to represent it in a fancy way, which is making a, a, a table and setting the parameters that I'm looking the, com the, the common behavior or the differences between of the different architectures, right? And this is more like, you know, straightforward for somebody who would like to memorize them. So in instruction types, the risk, the instruction of it is very simple. While 
the CISC, the, the level of instructions is really complex. We're gonna talk about this more into chapter two. Then the number of instructions we have for RISC is between 30 to 40 instructions, while number of instructions we have for CISC is around 200, is extended. The duration of instruction, that means every single instruction take how much, we already defined that in the previous slide, which is just almost the same time, which is uh, uh, one cycle. While the, as we said, every single instruction has its own uh, um, uh, specification that can be between four to 120 cycles per instructions. An instruction format in RISC is fixed, and instructions format in CISC variable, while execution in the RISC is a pipelining and execution in CISC is sequential. Addressing modes in RISC is simple, addressing mode on the CISC is complex. And instruction accessibility to the memory, just load and store, the other one, load and store was processing. Processing that means you can involve the arithmetic logic unit uh, unit or central processing unit if we are talking in a larger scale processor. Register set, we have the GPR as you asked, which is a multiple uh, registers inside the GPR. While in assist, there is yes, multiple registers, but each register is a unique in his job. For instance, in the, in the risk, you have R1, R2, R3, R4, you can use any of them depends on the availability, right? But in CISC, no. R1 is specifically for something, R2 specifically for something else, R3 specifically for something else. So every certain register it has its own job and requirement for accessing this register. And the complexity, where exactly the complexity in RISC? RISC, the chip is very simple. It's very straightforward. So if you make life easy in a hardware, definitely the life in the compiler or the level between the end user and the chip would be much difficult. Here's compiler is the complex part in the whole stack of RISC. While the complexity in the CISC is actually in the processor itself, because there is a level of programmability that chip is offering while also there is another of programmability the user and compiler stack is offering. So back to the point, if you would like to set up a fair comparison between risk and sys, we have to look into this table and think about it carefully. And while we are moving into the, uh, while we are moving closely to finishing the, to the, to the course, you will you will feel the comparison carefully. Sounds good. Sounds yeah, good. that sounds good. So there is also a different way, which is also acceptable for making a comparison between risk versus CISC. So people can tell you, I have a few instruction in risk, while I have several or many of them in CISC. Also, the chip uh, in the RISC is really quite small, while the chip in the, in the, C, uh, in the CISC is quite reasonably big because it's, uh, it's holding macro of instructions on the chip. The amount of power is consumed in the, in the RISC is much lower than the amount of power is consumed by the complex CISC. While because the maximum frequency in risk lower than the maximum frequency in CISC. And we already defined the reason of that is the critical path and, the, and how we can use it, right? For CISC, most of the microcontrollers are CISC based, except PIC, which you guys took in 30, uh, 3301. Okay. While in risk, Harvard architectures and pipelining are literally using RISC. And I have a news for you. The one who invented RISC is IBM. So the power uh, architecture of the processor, the processor is called PowerPC. So if you search on the internet, you'll find there is something that's called power. 
PC, and this guy have been used for Power PC 7 and 8 have been used in Curiosity that was deployed and sent to Mars by uh, a couple of years ago by Jet, Jet Proportional Lab. And the new version, the newer version of the Power PC is already on the new um, uh, rover that have been recently deployed on Mars by Jet Proportional Lab as well. Okay. Um, CISC is literally more in Newman architecture, while RISC more into Harvard architecture. Make sense? Um, RISC, some of the level of Intel was using RISC, but the newer version is using CISC. I'm not sure if you guys heard about um, the, the Pentium. Have you guys heard about Pentium? Yes. So, you know, the, the era of I processor was what? I3, I5, I7, I9, I11, right? And they built Xeon, and they built the Xeon silver, uh, gold, and diamond, or something like that. And then they built another era of processors, basically for the supercomputers and multi high performance computing task servers. Um, before this, they used to have Pentium, Pentium uh, one, two, and three. And before that, it was 80, 86, 80, 80, and all of this old version of chips. Okay, so we finished this patch of slides and we need to have a conclusion about what we learned out of it, right? What we learned out of it, it was a, a quick introduction about what is the connection between what we learn in the digital logic as a beginning entry course for the computer uh, engineering. And then, you know, we moved and how can, you know, this will affect on the design from the transistor level to the logic level, pushing up into the processing level. And then, you know, how, you know, the transistor technology will affect on the number of gates on the chip. Then we start talking about different type of architecture and uh, under the umbrella of ISA, which is an instruction set architecture. We said the new man started the, the wheel and then you know he came with one memory, it's segmented in pages and each page whether that it will have data or instruction. Then to make it more convenient for the people who work in a low power requirement, they move into something else which is called Harvard architecture, which is the dividing the memory into segments of either that instruction for memory or data for memory. And of course, there will be segments of pages inside this memory. But of course, the controller that it will be controlling the data flow from this memory will be more much simpler and less resources used on the chip than the Harvard architecture. Then we found that there is two different type of architectures that also running the ISA, one is called RISC and the other one is called CISC. And we define RISC as reduced instruction set computer while the CISC is a, a com complex instruction set computer. And we define the comparison between of them in three different type of categories, starting by just loading and storing and how the data would be processed through the registers of the memory. And in the top of that, we look into the cycle duration and how that will be affected by number of instructions and uh, powers and how it will be consumed less or more much. It depends on the CISC and RISC. And then we set up a very nice comparison table based on the instruction type, number of instructions, the duration of instructions, and the format of instruction and execution time of instructions, and the different addressing modes which is accessing the memory, and uh, also the register levels uh, for the GPR and the complexity between the risk and CISC, and also comparing in terms of the architectures and the power, and then on top of that also about the application and the favorite chips that have been identified by CISC and RISC. Sounds straightforward to everybody? Clear? Uh, yeah, it seems pretty clear. Super. What type of question you can get out of this uh, set of slides? What is the difference between CISC and RISC? What is the difference between Harvard and uh, Newman, right? Um, what is the effects of the 
number, all of the intersection will be running with the same uh, with the same number of cycles, stuff like that, right? Who is actually consuming more power, risk or risk? What type of applications is do, uh, what type of platform is already popular using the architectures between risk and risk, and so on. Now we're gonna move into the second level of the course, which is basically moving into the performance evaluation. So I'm gonna go now and share with you um, another level, which is called lecture two. And that by end of the lecture, it will be shared with you also on the canvas um, uh, week number two on the modules, okay? So let's see. So now is looking into building big computers, right? So when I say computers, what is computer? We said about the technology, we already, we already covered this very well. We don't need to repeat it. What type of novel application we needed for the computer? Like, you know, the auto, uh, auto, automobiles or like, you know, auto cars or like auto shops and then, you know, cell phones, it has already uh, a kind of a smartness. So if you guys remember, the industry when you have a kind of computing elements on the on the top of the on the top of the product they add the word smart right so if you have a, a like a certain level of memory and certain level of computing and the crystal that will associating this they will call it smart like the tv when they already added a processor into it and a storage they call it a smart tv your phone like you know from nokia which is like 33 have you guys heard about this style of uh, phone? That's model of phone. Have you guys ever heard about it? Yes. It's a Nokia 30 to trend. Yes. yes. This, that, you know, I used to have one like those, right? This one, if you go in a skyscraper, right? And throw it, you know, you will find it uh, perfectly fine. We'll just be afraid about the ground, you know, because it would be broken, <laughs> you know, because it's very strong and really feasible and you know you can live with it forever right now you know if you bring your iphone and you know throw it from the second floor right it will be broken right if i even i dump it now on the ground from the desk it will be broken right let's show you that you know i don't know what is the directivity of the industry making fragile you know you can buy more or what i have no idea but before it used to be very strong right material wise basically also computers, it's looking into the world web. Like, you know, there are dedicated servers. Most likely have you, you know, do you remember when you write www dot something, something, dot something? Did you see this dot? Can you imagine that this dot is belong to what? Somebody can tell me why we have this dot. Huh. You know what is this dot? Dot server is located in New York. The biggest server ever you can imagine. It's called dot server. So every time you need to search, you need to go to this dot server. That's why you put dot, 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 dot. Okay? World Wide Web. Uh, search engines like Google. Google, they have already their own entire server or you know warehouse server or whatever you can call, right? Also, there are other computers for specific reasons, like computers for like you know for uh, Tesla, right? There is a computer just for the mirror. There is another computer for the lighters. There is a computer associated with the trunk to open the trunk or close the trunk. So specifically for a certain job. So if you look into the old level classification of computer, you will find there is this computer, there is server computer, and there is the embedded computers that you know can be added into a level of uh, customers applications. So disk, desktop, that means general purpose, right? I can use it for anything. And it has a variety of software. I can deploy on my PC here, MATLAB, Vivado, Quartos, uh, you know, Python, IDLE, whatever, 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 right? And the subjects people will look into it is what cost versus what performance. 
So for instance, if you go to, uh, how many of you guys really in, uh, in favor of micro center? I mean, it's the only one in California and- In Boston. Hmm. You know, my Disneyland visits is basically micro center. I love to stay in micro center as much as I can. Can you imagine every time I take my salary, I go there. You know, I spend a hell of money there. Why? Because, you know, they already have a lot, a lot of really nice high tech stuff. Of course, if you start comparing between the prices, you will find that Amazon sometimes is cheaper or maybe eBay or Alibaba or whatever, right? But, you know, somehow I really like to go there. And sometimes I find a very good actually um, uh, discounts. So when you go and you decide, you know, let's say that I'm a student, I have a budget, right? So I have a $2,000 in my hand. How I'm going to decide which best computer I have to buy based on this budget. So I have to learn what performance evaluation. Oh, I know about this, you know, uh, yes, I know that. I know that about, but no, no, Best Buy is not, is really expensive. <laughs> you know, I have this credit card Best Buy, right? They keep sending me, oh, you know, spend this amount of money, I will give you $50, you know, no way. Best Buy is very expensive. Anyway, so if you would like to learn the relation between cost and performance, chapter one in the Hennessy and Patterson book will help you. Because based on the performance metrics, you can build something that's called benchmark. And from the benchmark, you will feel the performance and you will start looking into how much you can spend to earn this performance. Like I will give you an example, right? You would like your laptop to have 32 gig memory, right? Up to like two years ago, the maximum memory you can have in your laptop, it was 16 gig, right? So of course, if the 32 gig now is available, that would be very expensive, right? So you need to figure out, oh, does it really worth for me to put a couple of thousand to get this uh, extra 16 gig? Or, you know, 16 gig is good, but I just need maybe to increase the size of the hard drive and so on. Make sense? Makes sense. For the server computer, there is a bunch of stuff you need to think about, right? Server computer, they are looking into what? Buffering. And in the buffering, that means I look into what? Networking. And there is a bunch of research have been made on something called NEC. Network interconnectivity uh, computers. Because, you know, for instance, do you remember when we were watching YouTube in the early, early time? It used to buffer a lot, right? So you stop a little bit and then you buffer and you stop a little and you buffer, right? Now, if you look into it, somehow there is a streaming like Netflix, uh, Hulu, uh, Disney Plus, whatever, whatever. Those guys are actually using the networking technology in a server level. So they are streaming with less buffering as a one of the backup they can use if your network is very slow. Also, the high capacity and reliability. Is this servers are reliable or the server at any time something wrong will happen, it will just cut off. Are those guys already associated with a very strong UPS that will be giving power if some shortage happened? Who knows, right? Also, the range of the server computers is really vague. It's something between little itty bitty tiny servers into a very large server. So for instance, if you look at my camera here in my office in the ground, there is a server. It's basically around maybe 40K. If you look into it, it has like a six GPUs high end and a terabyte of memory and so on. If you don't have much money, there is a server node, you can get it for 5K or 3K and even 2K from uh, Lenovo or Dell and so on. So, but then, you know, you will be compensating the, the performance. How many users can use this uh, node at the same time and so on, which is, they call it what software is scheduling, okay? Then if we shrink these servers and computer to meet the requirement of our power uh, constraints, then we are talking about embedded computer, right? Computer, you know, a little computer inside my refrigerator that will be uh, monitoring the bunch of sensors to check the temperature and pressure, right? 
that's actually under the umbrella of IoT plus smart cities. And of course, here is no longer cost and performance. No, we're gonna add the power and uh, as another level of comparison in this uh, specific event. That makes sense to everybody? Great, okay. Now we look into the market because we have to connect what we are studying to the market, right? I believe majority of you would like to be end of the day joining um, industry, right? So if you look into the cell phones and PCs and TVs from 1997 up to 2007, and I'm sure that if you just extend it to 2022, you will find out that the, um, the phones, cell phones was actually taking a small amount of the whole entire market, but you know, in, went up really high because we add the smartness into the phone. We add the smartness into the PCs. We add the smartness in the TV and so on. But you know, TV, I'm sorry, um, uh, the TV is this one, I believe. This is the phone, yes. So a smartness in that phone, I can send a command from the phone if I, for instance, have an uh, iPhone and I have the Air TV, right? If you have the Apple TV, then you know you can broadcasting what you have in the phone on the TV. If you already have an iPad, you can broadcast it directly to the TV. There is a bunch of other developers. They made a, um, Android and the Linux and Unix based application to compete with the Air, Air, Air TV uh, with the process of moving into the TV and also uh, TV and screens and, and PCs, right? So those also uh, appreciating the adding smartness with computing into the elements like TV, right? And of course, performance evaluation will help us to improve significantly and also giving more pushes to this curve to go up over time because people will start to have a reliable feeling toward the product, right? If I look into the smartphone chip makers, as like we just took the phone now, right? You will find out that in 2007, the smartphone was taking this portion of the whole entire uh, market, while non-smartphone at that time, it was taking this portion. But eventually, if you extend it to 2022, you will find the non-smartphone is completely vanished. And the one is really taken over is basically the smartphone, right? Like I'll give you another example. Who really like, like, you know, uh, uh, taking pictures and, you know, photoshops and stuff like that. Any of you guys interested in this? Camera, right? Have you guys heard about a company called Codex? Yeah. So Codex, do you remember? I don't know if you know that or, you know, you were born in that, but, you know, Codex, they used to have like a film, right? You put it inside your camera and then, you know, you will go outside, you take your picture, then you have to go to a specific lab with that film, then he will do a process so he will give you the photos, right? And that was really something I can tell you that, you know, it was really appreciated like for the whole entire world. And Japan were like the lead on that, right? Then we start moving into what having SD card in the camera. Then Kodak just like, you know, uh, bankrupted recently, I think a couple of years ago. Then, you know, even, you know, Sony and, you know, Casio, whatever, whatever, like watches, right? Casio was the best, right? Now iPhone and, you know, iWatch is taken over and, you know, Fitbit, that's adding smartness and, you know, biological tracking into the watch is really much appreciated, right? So that's actually same thing if you look into the other field of the industry, excluding smartphone, as we already talked about. So we need to see how this curve is went up like that. So it came because of what? Processors. And it came because of what? Memories. So we look into the processor. The processor, because of the advantage of increasing and shrinking transistor, as we discussed in the early of this uh, course in the last week, 
we figure out to add more resources on the chip from the sequential and the uh, combinational behavior that we learned on the 2300. And we start adding more cores inside the chip, right? So for instance, in front of you here, i7, which is one of the Intel high-end processor, it has six cores processor. That means six element identical can do processing in parallel. Those six core, if you look into the processor, if you open the chip and you look really carefully, you will find that you already have a three cores in each side and each of them, it has a kind of memory, but it's SRAM based. And when we say SRAM is basically SRAM, it means static random access memory. You know what does static mean? It means the element inside this memory is built based on what? Huh? Transistors. Since it's built based on transistors, so it's limited in size. Since it's limited in size, that means it has a specific and special properties. And the properties for that is really has fast response. It's reply fast. When I ask and say, I want the data in row number five, they will say, boom, take it like that in a few nanoseconds. But of course, the size is the question is small. That's why, you know, three cores sharing this portion, three cores sharing this portion. And then there is another level of memory between of them, allowing you to move something from here to there, here to there, which is basically queued, unique or unicore memory. When we have a memory, it's just a naive table. It has to have what? A controller, right? So there is here the controller that will take care of the whole process. How those guys talking to each other, that will be completely covered in chapter five. Sounds good to everybody? Sounds good. Sounds good. What we learned so far out of this is the following. Adding more, computing element on the chip will add more powerfulness and of course will add more responsibilities on the people in the top of the hardware like the people who build driver compilers and application to speed up their application that will end up building us fancy product that will be reliable and the customers will what will be sure that you know he will use it without any fear of losing his money that he already invested in the product the second important player in the game beside the processor is the memory technology. So we said the memory is SRAM. There is another competitor of the SRAM is called DRAM. And then the DRAM, it stands for dynamic random access memory. And in the dynamic, if you remember from the uh, electrical courses we had taken here in, uh, at, uh, at uh, Cal Poly, you will find that the capacitor is a very good element to store data, right? So if I, if I apply a charge to the capacitor, the charge will be laying in the plates with a dielectric isolating between of them and storing the, storing what? The charge. But if this ideal case, but the material here over time with the pressure and the amount of charge is sorting on the plates will actually facing something is called what? Leakage. Do you guys remember? And the leakage over time will lose the amount I already stored here so over time, that will be like 3.5 or 4.2 or something like that. So imagine my actually one and zero, zero, nothing on the, on the capacitors. One is a five volt. Over time, over time, that five volt might actually go in a lower level that it will be degraded. So I, don't, I no longer know whether that, you know, I'm storing one or not. So the DRAM has a very good, has a very good advantage compare over the SRAM, which is basically the density. 
So I can add a lot of storage element on the DRAM chip that will allow me to store more data per gigabyte and terabyte, while SRAM can be megabytes maximum or kbytes. On the other hand, the SRAM is having a faster response compared to the DRAM. And the reason for that, they have something in the DRAM is called a refresh rate. What is refresh rate? Every single amount of time, the capacitors will have a checker to check whether that there is actually need to compensate 4.2 to turn it back to five and add extra voltage on that. And this time you cannot read and write. So of course, in total, the response time for the DRAM will be much slower than SRAM. And that's basically representing in front of you why the curve of SRAM, of the DRAM technology moving from 1976 to 2008 didn't go like here in terabytes. Have you noticed technology is moving slowly? But you know, technology in this gentleman is like really fast. So conclusion from this slide and this slide, processor is taking the speed of something is called Moore's law and Moore's law since 1964, saying that every single year, expecting that the chip will have twice of the number of transistors on it than the previous year. And the coding of the, the theoretical modeling they have to represent that, you know, we're gonna shrink the channel between the source and drain that I mentioned in the last week. Of course, since 2010, there is a big talk about, you know, Moore's law is end. And the reason that, you know, they can no longer shrink transistors in a way that, you know, they can get this two twice of number transistor per year on the chip. Sounds good? Sounds good. Sweet. Memory performance, even that, you know, we increase significantly from K to gig, whatever, is still, I don't see it a huge jump, right? But, you know, while they are defining the DRAM, they are looking here into uh, regions, right? You can see the region, right? So if you look into the micro center and you go by your, your memory, the guy will tell you, do you want a DDR3 or do you want a DDR4 or do you want a DDR2 or do you want a DDR1 or do you want it what? So what is DDR? So DDR is the controller of the memory, which is helping you to improve the response time. So there is another performance metrics we're gonna learn in chapter five, which is called BW, bandwidth. What is bandwidth? The amount of data I'm allowed to take, whether that I'm a GPR or a processor from the memory per second. So what is the best memory ever we can have in life? Then one, it will give us infinity amount of data per, per second, right? Do you agree? Yeah. Is it, is it feasible? Is it possible? Of course, then now not. But there is a hope coming from the different level of understanding computing, which is called quantum computing. So when I said is amount of data I want per second, why per second? Why, why I don't bring the infinity number of data in zero time? So before I think about the data that will come to me. So quantum, do you already define some phenomena in the quantum is called entanglement. Entanglement. And in entanglement, it's a based on the particles, right? Or photons and the spinning of the particle. So the particle here in the beginning of the universe, the particle here is the end of the universe, right? So if this particle, the polarization went like this direction, you will find this particle polarization will go in that direction. Even though these two guys, they don't have any channel between of them. They don't know each other, but they are in, entangled. That can open the door. If I have a processor, I have a memory and I entangle them, the processor will have all the memory here in zero time, right? And there is, um, there is a research Leaded, uh, by, led by uh, Netherlands 
uh, TU Delphet University and funded by the European Commissioner, which is equivalent to something here in the US is called NSF, National Science Foundation, uh, for defining uh, internet using entanglement of quantum. So the internet would be like pew, fast, okay? So now we understood in a level of application, we went to the cost, cost versus performance and all of things. Now we're gonna move into, we keep saying performance, performance, but what type of metrics we're gonna use for evaluating our performance. So why from the beginning we are studying performance metrics? For reasons. And here I define the possible reasons for you, which is one, determine the bottleneck or the lake of benefits of design. What does it mean? I would like to define what limitation my design has and what benefit to appreciate what I built. So that's why I need performance metrics. Then computer design is really complex. So we defining the, as I said, bottleneck here is very important and we can look into the intuition. Also, have to be careful about what to measure and how to measure. So be careful to misuse uh, some performance evaluation metrics because you know that will give you a wrong context or a, a wrong conclusion uh, you can build for evaluating a system. What you should get out of this discussion, first, good metrics for measuring computer performance. Second, what this should be was for. I'm using it for what? I'm using it just because I would like to pass the course or I would like to use it with implication of understanding what's going on around me. And the third, what metrics I shouldn't use and how I'm gonna misuse them, okay? So to understand, when I look into my whole entire system, how the performance would be affected. So the performance would be effective from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top of the whole system, right? So for instance, if I'm a, if I'm a user, end user, and I'm programming an algorithm, right? So I have to determine how many operation this uh, algorithm will be consisting of, right? So how many add and subtract or multiply or divide I will do while I'm processing this algorithm from the top to the bottom. Based on that, the performance will be evaluated from this specific section. Then also after this, how my adding and subtracting multiplying would be translated to the level of the chip would to understand that mean compiler language, I'm using a Python or I'm using C or I'm using a compiler uh, GCC 8 plus plus or I'm using GCC 7 plus plus differences will be uh, uh, noticed. So, you know, of course, every time they increase the level of the version of the uh, compiler, that will be showing more uh, optimization in the footprint and memory and amount of execution time will be significantly go down. So programmability, compiler architecture that will determine how many instructions, machine instructions will be executed. Do you remember one of the slides in the last week, I showed you uh, three lines of the C code translated to a couple of lines in the assembly, translated to a couple of lines in machine learn and machine uh, instructions, same thing. So that will be telling me how many I will execute per operation. Then also to understand the performance, I need to understand my processor and my memory system. How can I execute an instruction? how much time this instruction will be taken. Also, when I will communicate with uh, IO. So I'm writing on my keyboard that will also be affected in the total amount of time I'm taking to execute. Um, uh, I'm representing something from MATLAB on the, my speaker, how much time it will take. For instance, you know, people, uh, people actually build the, the pure sounding system from gold. Do you guys know that? So the jack or the connectors of the headset, if it's really high end, it will be built from pure gold because the connectivity will be faster and the execution will be appreciated. 
Make sense to everybody? Makes sense. Super. So since it's 2.11, you just have four minutes left. I know that you guys can jump directly to another uh, lecture. I can stop here. And from uh, Wednesday, we can start talking about the performance evaluation and we can start to have some examples. After we finish chapter one, I will give you a set of questions in, um, uh, on the canvas. And I give you one week, you will answer them. Then the day that you will submit, the day that I will submit my solutions so you guys can learn out of it, which will help you to prepare for quizzes and midterms and so on. Any questions? Any no concern? Questions. Huh? No, I just will these slides like... be on Canvas? What? Will these slides be on Canvas? Yeah, yeah everything we're doing Canvas. Okay, we're great. So, you know, you. Uh, Sabine, you know, Canvas, you know, uh, under modules, right? You will find uh -huh. one. You will find uh, week one, right? I already placed it there. Now we are week two, one. Right? You will find another uh, folder called week two, and there you will find a copy of these slides and also a copy of recorded uh, video of this lecture. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, guys. It was my pleasure to talk to you. Please stay safe. And I'm looking forward in 12 days or 13 days to meet you on campus uh, as we're going to resume our activities for in-person uh, work. OK? Thank you, Professor. Have a wonderful day.